you have a practice or are you running a business? Valuation is the ultimate KPI. Hey there, it's Mike Langford. Welcome to another episode of the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast brought to you by Trulytics, the one and only comprehensive advisor transition management platform. This week on the show, I have Bill Triglis from Canon Financial Institute with me, or William Triglis III. You know, I've got a great affinity for my Roman numeral guys. I'm one myself. I'm Michael Langford II. Uh, the second, yeah, not junior because, well, Dad thought it would sound too much like Sonny if I was a junior, so I'm the second. Roman numeral guys, we gotta hang tight. So anyways, fantastic to have Bill on the show. We're gonna be talking about advisor transition from a completely different lens. Bill got his start in the industry in 1979, and as you might imagine, the advisor profession has transitioned quite a bit in that 40 years plus, sorry. Sorry to date you there, Bill. But anyway, really good stuff. We're gonna be having a fascinating conversation talking about how the advisor profession has changed over that time period, but also how it continues to change and some of the changes we actually see happening right now, those transitions from just a an investment advisor to many advisors having to go to a much more comprehensive advisory role, right? Going into having financial planning as part of your business, being able to advise on other types of investments. We've talked about that on this show before, right? Needing to broaden the spectrum of the services that you offer to your clients in order to remain relevant for those clients and also to be competitive, frankly, in the industry going forward because more and more advisors are offering financial planning, tax planning, uh, estate planning type of solutions plus a whole lot more, right? So you're going to love this conversation. I love the fact that Bill is just such a wealth and fountain of knowledge. Uh, you're going to love it. Fantastic stuff. All right. As always, make sure you like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. We are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, the YouTubes. If you like video, uh, check it out. Leave a comment there, of course. And again, smash that subscribe or follow button depending upon the solution that you're using. Uh, also, if you have questions or suggestions for a topic or a guest for this show, please do send those in. Podcast at truelytics.com or you swing by the Truelytics website, use the contact form or just hit us up on the socials. You'll find Truelytics and at Mike Langford basically everywhere, okay? Love to hear from you. All right, let's get to our conversation with Bill Trickler. Well, Bill Triglith, so wonderful to have you on the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Delighted to be with you. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you too. And I can't begin to tell you how excited I am for today's conversation. Because, you know, after you and I chatted uh, with our prep call a few days ago last week, uh, I kind of started drawing some of the parallels in my brain a bit uh, about a recent deep dive I've been doing into my family tree on Ancestry.com. And if you haven't tried that out, it's, it's really an interesting solution. They have a free service and then I, I've upgraded to the paid service. And this is not a commercial for Ancestry.com. It's just really interesting uh, parallels here. Uh, but you know, as you dig into the history of your family, of, of where you came from, all sorts of little details pop up. Some of them are just kind of fun and quirky. Like for instance, my great grandmother, happened to be born in the same small town here in Texas where my dog was born. And 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 I had never even heard of this small town and, and until I adopted my dog. We, we got a, uh, an Australian shepherd and the breeder was based in this town called Gatesville, Texas. And then uh, doing Ancestry.com, I found out my great-grandmother was born in Gatesville, Texas. No way, this is pretty wild. And, uh, but, you know, and then there's other stuff too that's like, you know, you, you go through history and you find out there's some lackadaisical uh treatment of spellings of names and so forth. You realize that your, you know, your great grandmother's name is spelled like four different ways, <laughs> like depending on what document, you know, whether it's a census, a birth certificate or whatever. It's like, did nobody know how to, like nobody asked, like, how do you spell your name and, and, and write it correctly? But, you know, during our prep call, one of the things that was really fascinating to me is that you just happened to mention that you got your start in this industry in 1979 as a broker. And as I, I'm thinking about, my ancestry.com journey. And I was thinking about this industry and I'm fascinated by this industry. Uh, you know, it, it feels like we have a duty to the audience 
to kind of go a bit on a journey of the ancestry uh, of the modern financial advisor as an occupation. So I wonder if uh, you wouldn't mind uh, sharing some details about like some of the major changes you've seen over the course of your career in terms of the, the advisory profession. You know, because as the old saying goes, uh, you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been type of thing. <laughs> So oh, what, if you might, sure. what are some of the major turning points that you've seen since 1979? Well, uh, I've really got to reach back here now. You challenged me a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, when I, when I first started, um, the Dow was roughly around 1,000 points. And we saw, you know, over, over the years, I've seen some really major corrections, uh, but I, I can remember distinctly one correction coming to mind, which was the Hunt Brothers margin call when they were trying to corner the silver market. And the Dow that. dropped 22 points, and everybody <laughs> thought it was the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that, that sort of, that, that definitely dates me. But, uh, you know, the evolution of the industry has been sort of fascinating because you think about... Um, and I'm not going to go back to where we were trading stocks under the tree in New York City. But <laughs> if, you think, if you think about uh, uh, w when I came into the business, uh, the, the criteria for um, becoming a financial advisor, a, a broker, or a registered rep, which is what we were called back in those days, mm. was basically, could you sell something? Did you have a personality and could you relate to people? There wasn't a whole lot of training and requirement to have a finance background at all. Mm. And you pick that up along the way. And uh, over, gosh, over the few decades that I've been in, in the industry, the mimicry of what other people are doing really hasn't gone away as a platform for a lot of people's success. Not that mimicry is bad, um, you know, it's, it's really actually very efficient. But uh, when you think about uh, advisors and as they've come along through the years, even though these external changes are occurring, uh, and what I mean by that is Schwab coming in with the change to uh, discounted commissions, mm -hmm. and then the evolution of the day traders and using the various stock platforms for individual investors to go and do their own trading. Um, the move of the banks through the National Holding Powers Act, where they were able to uh, sort of collapse the Glass-Steagall wall that separated commercial banking and, and investment banking. And all of a sudden, you've got this big merger, these one-stop shops that Citigroup and others tried to create so that uh, they could maximize opportunities with their clients, both in the retail side as well as the institutional side. A lot of those changes uh, that occurred really didn't affect the the individual advisor that much um, mm -hmm. in terms of the requirements for coming into the business. Now, you had a major shift when the College for Financial Planning and, and the Endowment for Financial Education group came on board and created the CFP, ex uh, for example. Um, that sort of started uh, people thinking about different ways to engage with people around wealth management. It wasn't about just pure investment management. And that has grown quite a bit in terms of uh, its influence over the years. So, so the external changes, really starting with Charles Schwab and sort of some of the demises of, of uh, different firms, Obviously, the collapse in 2008 of Lehman Brothers and, and those things, um, but just the, the whole shift of the industry and, and the adjustments that were made has been pretty remarkable. I don't, I don't know that that gives anyone a sense of, of history. I could probably do a better job of crafting a timeline for you uh, of what those changes have occurred, but, but really, if you boil it down, it's the it's the markets themselves have become uh, just more ubiquitous in society. And that, that was a function of the 401k and the retirement plan development where everybody was investing in stocks. Mm. Um, and prior to sort of a lot of that ERISA activity that took place, 
that allowed that to happen, people were involved in pensions and they didn't have any control over their own pension and the investments associated with that. They just sat back and thought about, hmm, I, I bet I'm going to get a nice income stream from my company. Of course, a lot of those companies that people had belonged to uh, have since gone out of business and a lot of those pensions went away. So from the perspective of the individual investor, probably the biggest change was the ability to have some control over their retirement money. Mm. And that was a little scary uh, when, when that came about because people didn't trust individuals to have much education in the investment uh, domain. Yeah. So advisors took on the role of helping educate those people that wanted to invest, and that created a marketplace for them. And so, you know, I don't know how many trillions are invested in retirement accounts right now, but it's a yeah. lot. And um, and whenever the market has has its hiccups, and I hear pundits on the news saying, you know, the rich people got hurt. <laughs> in reality, it's everybody that gets hurt when, sure, when sure. the markets have corrections. You know, that's that's uh, something that seems to be lost in the in the news media. Yeah. You know, you can have a couple of really, I think, seismic shifts that, that it, it, one of them I hadn't really thought much about. And I'm glad you brought it up. You know, the, the first one is, you know, kind of the, the changing business model, if you will, for the for stockbrokers to financial advisors, right? And we've talked a lot about it on the show about, you know, most of today's financial advisors, particularly those who meet the average age, we talk about a lot, 60, 62 of, of today's financial advisor, got their start as stockbrokers, as registered reps, as you mentioned. One of the things that was really different back in the old days, and I'm talking about old days, like when I got my start in the, in the 90s, right, <laughs> is commissions, or a big deal. And these commissions were pretty high when you think about it, like sometimes five, six percent commissions on a stock trade or on, on a on a mutual fund uh, trade. And, and, and that, you know, that fries people's brains now to think, especially since a lot of things are free trading. Uh, you mentioned Sh Charles Schwab kind of introducing the concept of, of discount brokerage, which uh, democratized to the masses, the ability to buy stocks, right? Prior to that, you had to have a really good amount of money to invest in stocks and you had to be able to afford the commission, right? Obviously. And then you had to have the timetable of being able to hold on to the stock long enough to get into uh, above you know, water when you know, you're low commission, right? If you buy something that and pay a 5% commission, you got to wait a little while for that stock to go up enough to make that commission worth it. Um, so that's, a, that's fascinating to think about. So, and advisors have been dealing with that since, his, since the dawn of time, the, the model changes. But the other thing that you kind of, I hadn't given as much thought about, and I'm so grateful that you brought it up, was because of the 401ks, right? Self-directed uh, defined contribution plans versus defined benefit traditional pension plans becoming the norm, a new need arose. The average worker suddenly needed to know how to manage their own investments, needed expertise because they just don't. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, most people know, they don't even know what a stock is. If you ask the average person on the street, like, tell me what a stock is. And like, well, it's a stock. Yes. <laughs> you know, they, they just wouldn't know, right? They wouldn't understand what a common stock is versus a preferred stock versus, you know, well, what is a bond? What, what's the difference between debt and equity financing for a company and, and, and the like? What's well, a mutual fund? They just wouldn't understand. Uh, and, and our industry recognized that and said, you know what we need? People who can communicate, who can translate to the average human well, you call, these people are financial advisors, they're brokers, they can go out and talk to a regular human being and kind of communicate the value of what these things are and articulate the complexity of them. That's, that's fascinating. I'm glad you brought that up because it really translates into what we're dealing with today. If you think, if you think about it like this, the old saying was stocks and mutual funds are sold, they're not bought. Yeah. Today, that's really reversed. Okay. People yeah. are buying those whether they're getting help in doing it or not is, you know, is something else. So um, you, you think about that change in the consumer's mind. I've, I've got to learn the language and the language being infused in general society because um, there are so many 
news outlets and sources of information about this now, layered on top of all the technological advances that have allowed a lot of this iteration to occur. And so the, the industry is sort of transforming. So you've got uh, individuals that are now engaged because they have to be. Yeah. They're learning more because, right, people talk about it around them all the time and they're surrounded by the information. And the technology advancements allow for more efficiency in processing the activities that the individual advisors are doing. And so you mentioned the 5 to 6% uh, commissions in mutual funds. And I can remember the two points in a bond, you know, and people ringing the bell. <laughs> I, <laughs> I got a $100,000 order, <laughs> you know. Uh, but when you think about what's taking place, uh, and this is natural in, an, in a maturing industry, and, and we're really maturing very fast right now, um, in a maturing industry, right, all, all the players start to look and act and feel the same, and they start delivering the same products. Well, when that takes place, it's called competitive convergence. And competitive convergence always ends up in commoditization. And so we're wringing out all these excess fees and, and things like that, uh, making the system that people participate in more effective. Now, it's not necessarily good for financial services professionals, right? Because they've got to find new ways to bring value to, to their clients. But for the consumer, it's really been uh, very, very helpful for them. And it's broadened, as you mentioned, democratized access to the markets and, and the use of the markets to grow and uh, preserve wealth over time. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it's been a fascinating transition over the last 45 years that I've been <laughs> in the business. Um, and Sorry and to I've date you, by the way. I just, I think it's, I, 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 uh, I really love digging with, with people who have seen more than I have, right? I, I love digging in and hearing uh, that perspective, right? I just think it's so valuable to, to think about it because, you know, we're, we're dealing with a massive wave of transition now, but it's, it's, it's not new, right? Transition has happened, right? A lot of these business transitions, these changes, you mentioned that you know, the, the, the industry has matured a bit. You know, uh, you know, the course, core thesis at, at TrueLytics is, you know, we're in this early stage of a, a great wave of advisor transition. And, 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 and that thesis is, you know, based on demographics, right? We expect to see a large percentage of advisors exit the business and transition their books to other firms or the next generation of advisors through succession. We also expect to see a lot of M&A activity beyond succession as RIAs and advisory firms look to scale. As you, as you just pointed out, when we get to a point where commoditization is starting to take hold, where pricing is pretty level, where, where everybody sells the same services for the most part and same products for the most part, businesses start to roll up. They get, they get bigger to achieve more profit. And we see that in just about every single industry, right? And then eventually there'll be another wave of innovation and you'll see other little ones pop up and, and, and things will get a little more disparate. disparate well, excuse me. You know, when you think about this competitive convergence leading to commoditization, the natural outcome of that in any industry is consolidation. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's just going to happen because that's, because that's the only way that you can, can compete yeah. from a margin standpoint, because you've got to scale. And right. so advisors, individual advisors, as they've sort of gone through this journey, and I'm thinking about, you know, my contemporaries, the, you know, the baby boom group, We've really seen and had to make adjustments to all of these technological advances that are occurring. What's interesting is we're sort of reaching the end of our careers. Our professional vocation is sort of coming to a close and we've got a choice that we have to, to be making. You know, Do I want to craft something that outlives me or do I want to sell right to someone else and monetize whatever I can from the work that I've created from from potentially the equity that I've built up, um, or do I want to live off of what I've built up? And as my clients die off, I just work less. <laughs> you know? so, yeah, it, but, it, and that, by the way, I, th those are real choices you see people make. I mean, it's, it's sure. very common for people to, uh, as I think uh, the term I keep hearing used is retire in place, right? They just basically decide, you know what, I, I, 
I'm going to work less as my client. I have fewer clients and fewer assets as they, they uh, either, like you say, die off or they consume their assets. My AUM declines over time. Uh, or like you said, they, they're exiting the business or they're innovating. One of the things that the advisors in, in my age group are, are, are having to struggle with right now is with the technology advancements and their, old, their, their business model built on a platform of if you want to be an investor and, and you want to grow your wealth, being coming to and working with an advisor is the best way to do that, right? Right. Um, now, that was all premised on having access to the marketplaces, having access to products, being able to give you price quotes, uh, custody your, your assets, give you statements, those kinds of things. Now, all well, that's really free. Mm. And advisors today are in a place where uh, you know, they're having to sort of think through, how do I fold free into my business model? Yeah. And, and you can do that, but you have, to, you have to be really thoughtful about what you're trying to do, and, and you have to reorient yourself to what your value is. Yeah. And at any age, change is difficult. But at the end of our career, it's really very difficult for people to sort of think about, how do I start over? Mm. And the key to helping them uh, think through that is, you're not starting over, you're shifting your place in the value chain. Uh, Economics 101 will tell you that, uh, you know, the value chain starts with raw goods. Mm. And then from raw goods, you create products from those, right? So uh, products then get bundled up and you create services. And then at the top of the value chain, you take those services and you deliver experiences. So the higher you go up the value chain, the less it, the less, or the more difficult it is to commoditize that experience. Right. And the more valuable that experience is. So experiences now are where advisors have to be thinking about what is the value that I'm delivering and how can I do that so that I can maintain uh, not only my place in the value chain, but I also can... Uh, uh, be profitable in doing it and, and, and have a living doing that. And so you can, you know, you can make adjustment, uh, not adjustments, but you can make parallels to, well, are raw goods and services or stocks and bonds and funds, you know, and, mm. and, uh, and the products that go in there are the managed accounts and the ETFs and things like that. And then the services that I provide include financial planning and investment management, and those things. But it's the experiences, which is the delivery of those at a personalized level that makes sense and is appropriate for each individual, that experience set is where you can, you can charge a lot of money. And we're seeing some really innovative um, approaches to creating business models based on delivering those types of experiences. And what's us uh, really unusual about this is you go to the millennials and the Gen Xers, they're all about experience. Mm. That's what they're living for, right? They they don't want to count their money. They want their money to count, <laughs> and the way they make it count is to think about, okay, what what can I do with this to make an impact for myself and my family, and then society in general. Mm. So, um, older advisors and younger advisors now can move to a place where experiences and and thinking about how you deliver experiences and what that experience is. Um, is the, is a way to deliver new value, and uh, it's it, it's really a mind shift for a lot of advisors to think about that because they're so used to being the expert that delivers the right answer mm. and knows exactly what the, the question should be, and the problem with that is the complexity of life has moved advisors to a place where what they used to do was kind of sophomoric. In, in relationship yeah. to what's required now, when, when you yeah. really think about it. And so we've got the advisors moving to a position of being a guide and a coach much more than they're being the, the expert because the yeah. expertise, because of technology, has moved the expertise to robotic process automations and expert systems. And anytime you're dealing with rules-based decisions like tax law or investment principles or whatever, the machines are going to outthink the people 100% of the time. So they're going to give them the right, the right answer, right? What, what you, we really need is, you think back to Daniel Pink's 
a book that he wrote, uh, uh, gosh, about uh, 15 years ago, A Whole New Mind. Mm-hmm. He said, as we move from the knowledge-based economy, right, to, uh, to a technology-based economy, the challenge is for experts to reposition where their expertise is in, in the value chain. Yeah. Because we used to just pull information together. Somebody, yeah. somebody used the analogy uh, of puzzles and mysteries. So puzzles is where we used to be, right? You have to find all the pieces and put them together to make things just right. Mysteries require you, because you've already got all the puzzle, mysteries require you to figure out the answers to the questions that the puzzle has laid out. Yeah. And so advisors need to figure out, you know, um, how do I help people ask better questions and then examine the consequences of the choices that they have and then give them guidance so that their cognitive biases, right, in terms of where they lean, whether they're ultra conservative or ultra aggressive or wherever they might be in a personality straight standpoint, how you mitigate them making bad choices to maximize the opportunity for them to get the best outcome possible. Yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. You know, it's, it, yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And it's, it's fascinating. I'm glad you, you, you articulated it the way you did. You know, when I got my start in this career, I'm, I'm the last, I'm Gen X, right? But I am the last generation of adults to become an adult before the internet existed. In other words, remember adult life, Anybody who became an adult after I did in you know, 1994, 1995, entered the workforce after that, had the internet. I'm the last generation to land in a corporate job and there's really no internet as you know it, right? Um, and so one of my first jobs was answering phones for mutual fund companies. And people would call in and go, hey, can I have the closing price of XYZ mutual fund, whatever it was? Or can you send me a prospectus for this mutual fund? I need an annual report for the... So it, it was because that information was not easily and readily available, right? It just, it wasn't, right? right? Yes. What you described was, you know, we used to have this information opacity and, 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 and asymmetry, right? If you are a broker in the 1980s or, or the early 2000s, you had in, a, a, a certain amount of uh, advantage over the rest of the world. You had access to information that just was not available to other people Uh, And the timing of the information was really uh, readily available. Like from a stock trading perspective, it was so simple, right? Like you could see what a stock was doing any point in time during the day, whereas the average consumer had to wait until the next morning to get their newspaper to see what IBM closed at, what it opened at and closed at. They didn't get to see all the ticks along the way, right? So you had information asymmetry. Now with the internet and then of course with mobile, my goodness, like any second of the day on my phone, anywhere I am on earth, I can see what IBM is trading at at any second. I can get in and get out whenever I feel like it. So that the value, as you described, the the value proposition of a broker back then was the fact that they had that information and they they could act on your behalf and they they could be the one who triggers an action. They could call you and say, you know, Bill, you gotta get out of IBM because it's been trending down a little bit. I want to make sure we lock in your gains or whatever. Now it's like, I don't need Bill to tell me. I don't Mike to tell me that. I can just, my phone can tell me to do that, right? I can Google information about IBM and and I can find out anything I need to know. What I need you to tell me is, should I be in IBM? And how does investing in IBM- It's the mystery, not not the puzzle piece. Yeah, exactly. And what does this mean for my my kid's college education or the legacy I want to leave or the charities, the the things that are important to me? As you you mentioned, the experience uh, economy. Uh, So I'm I'm so wonderfully happy that you brought that up because we kind of teed this portion of the conversation up about transitions. And as you and I talked about, there's more than one type of transition happening there. There is transition out of the business, of course, and in, you know, and growth of, of acquisition and succession planning and so forth. But there's transition while you're in the business, right? You're you have to if you are a 40 year old financial advisor right now, looking at another 25 to 30 years in this career, growing your business. There's going to be some transition of your business, sure, and you're going to have to think about it strategically. 
And I know, and I want to make sure we get to this because, you know, uh, there's a rec- you know, intro to this, this, this episode here, but, you know, we've got this far into it. I want to make sure we talk about what you and the team at Canon Financial Institute are doing for advisors, because this is, this is really the, this is where you're focused, right? You're helping advisors get better at their business and, and transition their business as, as the world evolves along. So I wonder if like, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the programs you have there at Canon and, and, and how it's helping advisors with this. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, let's let's pull our previous part of the conversation to sure. sort of set a platform for us. So the value promise that the advisors used to have that, that we just described is what they built their business model on, mm. right? So their business model is it was based on investment management, portfolio management, and helping people, um, uh, if you will, sort of, make tax advantaged investments, right? But it was basically the business model was, uh, I am the best place for you to come and mm-hmm. I'm gonna charge you a fee for doing that. So the initial fees were commissions, they went away. So they went to sort of separately managed accounts and, and AUM fees, right? And that's sort of a really big prevalent, that's a big prevalent uh, pricing scheme for most people's business models. And now we've discovered that the value of doing that has sort of gone to zero with the introduction of the robo advisors. And the real value for the advisor now is how do I interact and help you think through uh, as your life occurs and life events are occurring in that life, how that impacts and it can be supported by the wealth that you have or you aspire to have. And so it's not about portfolio management and asset allocation as much as it is thinking about what is the impact of what we have in place now when a life event happens to us? Do we have to rethink our goals? Do we reprioritize them? Do we create brand new ones? Do we abandon others? So advisors that are thinking about the client and finding solutions for the client, as opposed to thinking about their practice are the ones that are going to be more successful in the future. It's their orientation towards what they do. If your orientation is this is what I do and this is how I do it, and this is what I charge for it, now who can I sell it to? Mm. That is gonna be problematic because when you look at all the great companies that are, that are doing fantastic work these days, they've all adopted an external market orientation. What is my client trying to do? Mm. And what are the ways that I can help them do it better, faster, cheaper, you know, easier? And where in that uh, capability set that I can bring, do the consumers see that there's value in that and they'd be willing to pay for that? And that creates then an orientation towards what my product or service set ought to be. Mm. So, so we're trying to help advisors understand that they've got to flip their orientation and their orientation, not only to the market, but what, what their value really is in the value chain going forward. If they're able to do that, now they can start looking at segmentation. That's probably the best way to say it. Mm. And they can think about where are there large groups of people that need specialty types of help that I can find ways to help them get whatever job it is they're trying to get done, done in a better way. Now we're pulling from Stanford and we're pulling from Harvard and the schools of entrepreneurship in with the jobs to be done approach to product design. So as we're thinking about that, we're not, we're not suggesting that advisors abandon what they already have in their skill sets and their, their product sets. We're getting them to think differently about how they would apply that to different customer segments. Traditionally, people in uh, thinking about segmentation in our industry think about types of people, physicians, entertainers, dentist, the dry cleaner, the millionaire next door. You know, it, you get these people that are, uh, that are thought about from a demographic standpoint. Uh, but you can also change the orientation. To, and, and sometimes I get upset when I hear this. Segmentation is the right way to go. It's the only way to build your business and, and, and be great. <clears throat> and, and that's not true. 
you can take the segmentation strategies and think about people, any, any person in their life journey. And what they're going to find is you have some relatively standard co-located life events that's happened to you at different phases in your life. Yeah. So you can segment the marketplace uh, with these different groups of life events, and you can create product or service sets specifically to help people that are in that, that part of their journey. I love now, it. as you do that for everybody in the journey, now what you basically have is you've got a product or service set that's appropriate for, let's just say the people in the household of your accounts that you have in your book of business. So you might have a, a 50 year old husband and wife, two children that have just graduated college and a set of grandparents. And in that group, you basically have three different customer segments, people that are in different stages of their life with different needs. And for each one of those, you can create a set of products and services priced appropriately for them that you can generate new revenue streams from, from each of them. Now, instead of just having, well, my client's mother-in-law, you know, mm. needs some financial planning. I'm going to ask my advisor just to do that because they do financial planning for me and I can ask him a question. You can actually create product service sets and say, would you like to provide this product or service set to your grandmother or your parents-in-law or to your children? So you can, you can take the universality of life events in a client's life journey and create segments out of that, which is yeah. really powerful because now what you can do is you can figure out, Hmm, if, if I were able to sell my product and services to each of these types of clients in my, in my book of business, various, uh, various generations or life stage people, you can, you can think about how the cash flow from that would work. And now you can think about the cash flow over a couple of generations. And you can take a, an account that might have an economic value if you're just working with dad and, and hopefully you get to keep mom when dad passes away, which is not what the research tells us happens. You might have a, a, a $124,000 lifetime value client. But if you took all of those folks and you extended that over a 40, 45 year period, now all the combined cash flow from that could be as much as 750 or or a million dollars which which is a totally different way to think about how you value your practice and what's really important is it lets the advisor get away from the well i can't work with the kids because they don't have enough money to meet my minimum threshold oh <laughs> you know what are you, what are you saying? <laughs> what do you say? No, create a product or service set that helps those kids with where they are in life and then sell that, that to them, get them started as a client with small, you know, with smaller amounts of money. You do that through leveraging technology and really recognizing what it is that they need and then pricing it with your profit margin embedded into it so that even if you're just working with a child, let's say that's just going to college for a thousand dollars a year, you can give them a debit, you know, a debit card, uh, a financial, not a financial plan, but a budgeting strategy. Sure. You can have a conversation with them about the importance of managing their finances when they go to college. And, uh, and I promise you that mom and dad are going to pay the thousand dollars. If you can teach their kid anything about managing finances, you know, it's really, <laughs> I've had similar conversations that, that around this concept uh, recently, and I'm glad you're bringing it up. Uh, you know, what, what you're hinting at there I th is, hey, look, instead of looking at technology as a threat, right, to your business, look at it as an opportunity, right? So somebody has come out and built these robo-advisory solutions, as an example, right? Um, and you look at that as a threat, you're like, hey, listen, they're, they're, they're willing to manage a pool of assets, do ask basic asset allocation 
with this robo advisory solution and charge zero basis points? How do I compete with zero? Or are they charging 25 basis points? Well, I'm charging 100 basis points. How the heck do I compete with that? I mean, I'm basically going to do the same thing from an asset allocation point. It's not like I'm offering like, hey, my asset allocation is so much better than the robo. You're not, frankly, right? Uh, so now what do I do? Well, there's another way of thinking of that. As you And you just hit it on the head is, hey, look, because that's so inexpensive to apply and, and it so uh, frees you up from a labor perspective, you're not doing this manually, you could take a client who has way lower dollars to invest or is way earlier in their investment journey, right? And you could bring those clients on and they might be the children of your target client, right? Who is like 50 years old and has a million AUM, but their children might only have $10,000, right? And not even right. have started their careers yet. So you can actually serve the children now and be their advisor and you know offer some guidance and charge for guidance, not charge for AUM in that case. And that solves the some key, really important- The key is not to think about, I can, I can put the $10,000 in something and make money, yeah. right? The key is to think about, I can help this, this young person get done what they need to do. Yeah. And so you can charge a fee for that regardless of managing the money or not. And that's, that's the leap that advisors have to start thinking about. If my value is my advice and access to my expertise at the time that you need it, yeah, I can be paid for that. And then you decide, client, you decide if you're willing to pay for it or not. Yeah. So now I'm never over-serving a client as an advisor, because I'm giving them what I know that they need. And they're never overpaying me because they, they have said, for what you do, I'm willing to pay you. Yeah. And that's how the excess in this industry is sort of getting wrung out, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's a really nice interaction in, in, intersection because everybody wins at, at that point. Yeah. Nobody's taken advantage of. You know what? Another little hidden gem in, in in this that concept of what you're you're sharing there is a common problem for advisors, particularly those who are edging close to time when they want to have a succession plan in place, uh, or they're thinking about exiting the business. Is the average age of their client tends to be pretty darn close to their age, right? So if you're a 65 year old advisor, chances are your average client is about 65 years old. And that correlation across the industry is pretty darn strong. Because, and it makes sense. If you got your, if you got your start in your career and, and you're, you're 25, 30 years old, becoming a financial advisor, you were probably talking to your peers, people you went to college with, you know, and so forth. And so you started attracting those folks and they grew with you, but now they're, they're older. And if I'm a younger advisor, if I'm a 45-year-old advisor looking to grow my business and I'm going to buy your book of business, that's a problem because I know as, as valuable as that business is, it, it's likely going to atrophy over time as that client roster goes into net redemption. They start consuming the assets they've been building up. Sure. What you've just described is, it, is a really genius way to start making sure that you've laddered. If you think about a bond ladder, right? We, we, yes. we don't just buy all bonds that are maturing in the same date, right? We try to stagger them so right. that we constantly have a, a consistent level of income. And then, you know, one bond matures and we reinvest and, and so forth. We don't have them all at the same thing. The same as, thing as should happen. family members grow, right? right. They, they're changing life stage. So yeah. you, you basically created this really wonderful cash flow that you yeah. can project, yeah. you know, which that. is really good for business valuation. And, and the, the challenge for advisors is, well, how do I do that? <laughs> how do, you know, how, how, and it's so simple. It is, it is so simple. What you have to recognize is, and we all know this, but it's very few advisors that really take advantage of it. We know that making a connection with the spouse of the account holder that we've had a relationship with for a long time having a relationship with them is what allows that account to transition past that past their death. Now I'm, I'm going to date myself here in, in this, this is universal, but it's, it still makes a good analogy. When I was a broker, I was working with men 
right? Men were the money money decision makers, and the, and the, and so um, and a lot of us now still sort of think of the man as the as the money machine, but we know that women are um, probably control more wealth than men do at, at, at the moment. So so they're a, a fabulous group that we need to pay attention to, especially if we want to hold on to assets that a family yeah. is is connecting with. So having couples retirement planning conversations, no matter where they are in their life journey, is a natural way to segue and bring in the both spouses to sort of establish and think through what are the common efforts that we want to have in place that will help our family in terms of managing our wealth. And, and, and to be honest with you, men think about performance, but women think about performance and they also think about provision, right? Mm. What will the wealth do for my family? What will it do for my children? So as you move from getting connected to the couple and getting them sort of on board, it's a natural segue to talk about. Now let's talk about the impact of what we're doing and how it's going to affect the the extended family, your children and others. Well, that leads to family wealth planning opportunities. So in family wealth planning, you've got the common the common characteristics or attributes attributes or aspirations of the family that's common within the family. We want to make a difference in society. We want to support a specific cause. Um, uh, we want to um, uh, we want to have an impact wherever that impact might be. So, so those are the common things, and the family can all contribute to that. But also importantly is, how can we contribute to the growth of the family, especially where there are um, differences in what the aspirations are? Right. right. Everybody doesn't have to think lockstep. So the family can then start thinking about, what is it that you, daughter, son-in-law, uncle, if you want to extend it that far, um, what is it that you aspire to? What, what will make your life meaningful and, and, and be fulfilled? And how can the rest of us help lift you up to get to that place? It might be with fin financial support, but it also might not be. So now what you've done is you've created an on-ramp to bring the children into the family wealth planning conversations. And the natural segue there is, you become their financial advisor because everything is now interconnected, mm -hmm. right? What I'm doing also is connected to what the family wants to be, wants to do. And what I'm doing also can support the other members of my family to reach their aspirations. And the linchpin in the whole thing is the financial advisor. Yeah. So that's, that's how you move to this place where uh, I describe it as the client is the family. It's not the account holder. Yeah. And you're not the expert, right? The technician in financial planning or anything else. You're the clinician helping them think through how can we realize a whole range of wonderful possibilities that makes our life meaningful and enjoyable. And, and also, how can we support each other when these life events take place that we don't really want to plan for or even think about, but they're really negative job losses, divorce, deaths long-term sickness, you know, chronic illnesses, end-of-life issues, you know, those are things where the advisor can come in and say, when you experience this life event, I know the right questions that have to be asked, and I have a way to help you all uncover what is the right answer for you. I don't have your answer. Yeah. What I have is a way to help you find the answer that's important and will work for you. There's no right or wrong answer in a lot yeah. of these situations. Yeah, I want to dive into something you described. You talked about uh, in our prep call. Uh, you called it your your program that you have called uh, Certified Wealth Strategist designation that you, you created there. And I think it's really important based on what you were just describing there. It, it's a designation that you termed uh, a CFP without the math, and I love that concept because. Uh, what I happen to know about the industry, right? Because what you're describing there is the advisor has to level up their game, right? They can't just be about stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, right? And how do we allocate those things? They really have to start becoming a higher level financial advisor and life advisor, if you will, uh, as it relates to how these financial tools uh, 
are going to support that. And here's a little thing that we know, and I've mentioned this on the show once or twice. Most financial advisors have never actually studied finance. The majority of financial advisors do not have a finance degree. Most got their start as, as you talked about, stockbrokers and learned enough uh, about stocks, bonds, mutual funds to pass the Series 7. And and they could be licensed and they could sell securities to financial consumers. But that's, you know, that and that's not taking a shot at anybody. That just is the way that our business grew, right? That's not saying that you guys stink and you're terrible financial advisors. Most financial advisors care very deeply about their clients. They're definitely trying to do what's best for their clients. But as we mentioned, the the world is shifting a bit here. Uh, So maybe we could, you could talk a little bit about this certified wealth strategist designation that you and, and the Canon team uh, have developed because I think it's very important because I, I can imagine some of the advisors that are listening right now going, Hey, thanks a lot, Bill. It sounds like a wonderful thing. This whole like multi-generational thing, helping folks out and so forth. But dude, I sell stock. Like I'm, I make my money off AUM. I'm looking to bring assets in buddy. Like, so thanks a lot. How do I get there? Right. I, I, I yeah. 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 You're the certified wealth strategist, um, uh, Interestingly, uh, one of the big wirehouse firms had a group of people that had gotten their CFP, and this was probably 15, 16 years ago. And they came to us and they said that they just don't understand how to take advantage of all this great knowledge that they have. And there were some financial planning software tools that were out at the time, obviously, and some of them had picked those up, some of them didn't. So some were engaged in formal financial planning, others were kind of more ad hoc, ad hoc financial planning. And we said, well, what we need to do is we need to build a, a place for that knowledge to rest. And what we want to do is we want that knowledge to rest in a practice that's designed to deliver comprehensive wealth management, not just investment management. And we need to give people the knowledge set, really the skill set to use their knowledge in these client interactions. So we built that program for them. And then it, it just, the light bulb came on and said, you know, there's a lot of these advisors that are never going to go down the CFP route. And so instead of using the CFP to sit in the nest, we need to create a, a way for them to have an understanding of the concepts and the vernacular and the terms and definitions and the rules for a broad set of wealth management topics so that they can be helpful to their client. But the underlying motivation for that, them learning this information, was really more about getting them comfortable enough to hold a conversation about it. Because nobody wants to talk about something they don't know anything about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're just afraid of it. So, so getting them to a point where they could have a conversation also included giving them model conversation paths that they could go down and they could easily remember. So they, they have the knowledge around the concepts. The, they're not unfamiliar with the language. They've got a conversation path they can go down. And their business routines and activities in their practice are set up so that it drives that kind of a set of interactions over and over and over again. And then the benefit of all of this is now the advisor is really adding value in much different ways than they were just being an investment person, but they don't abandon their investment capability. They're just using it in a different way. And the premise that we base this on is you're not going to be the expert in all of these areas. So you're going to rely on experts and expert systems to support you. So if you can raise up the issue, if you can have great conversations around this, uncover the situation, right, that that the client is in right now, compare that to the aspirational goals that they have, then you, you generally uncover some gaps in that. Yeah. And your value is to close or narrow those gaps as much as possible. And without having the conversations, they'll never they'll never get to that place. Yeah. So so the financial planning software, the experts and their firms and alliances that they create with others in the community will help them come up with the right answer. And that's why we say a lot of times 
It's not the answer that's the most important thing for you. It's helping you help the client think about what is the right question that needs to be asked. Yeah. I think that's really smart that you, you, you bring that up because, you know, the, I think in many advisors' minds, there is this, I have to be the oracle for my clients. I have to know sure. all. And, and, and so I don't even want to bring up things that I don't handle. And, and I, I know I'm painting with a pretty broad brush. I'm sure m many, many advisors would bristle at the notion of, of that. They're like, hey, look, we're a team-based approach here. Like, what are you talking about? I don't mind sending them over to the CFP or, or, the, or, the, or, or the CPA or whatever. But your point is, hey, listen, you don't have to be the expert. You can still be the relationship manager, right? You don't have to be the genius when it comes to tax planning. You don't have to be the genius when it comes to estate planning or, or dealing with college planning or any of these types of things. Uh, you just have to know that I know where to go find the, the people who know the things we need to know to help you achieve your goals. And I can, because I'm the, 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 the point leader on this and I manage a relationship, I can make my money off this. Uh, I still can make some money on asset management as well, but I'm bringing the total value to you. I think it's a really, really smart recommendation. Uh, so we're getting towards the end of our, our time together here. Uh, but I, I thought a great way to, to close things out would be talking about dealing with change. And some of the notes you sent over to me, you and the team there, uh, help advisors deal with change a lot. Right? Think about it and, and, and create plans for doing it. And it's really interesting. A while back, Jeremy Carnell, the CEO of Truelytics, wrote this uh, blog post exploring what he termed transition IQ or TQ for short. And it's akin to the emotional intelligence quotient, right? The emotional quotient that we've heard, you know, what's your EQ type of stuff. And he was inspired at, at the time uh, that he spent with uh, the, the Modern Elder Academy, which is this fantastic organization, which is helping people navigate to this extended adulthood that we're all living now. That, right? You know, it used to be like, you know, where you're 55, 60 years old, like, you were, that's it, I'm going to be dying soon. In your mind, you're like, I'm retiring, I'm walking up. But now it's like... 50 years old, I'm like, I've got another 40, 50 years left of being an adult. There might be some other stuff I want to do. And, sure. and so we had uh, the, uh, Jeff Hamaui, one of the, the, the founders there of the Modern Elder Academy on with us on a podcast. So if you want to check that out, go check that out if you're listening to the show. Uh, but you and your team invest a lot of time in the concept as well. And, uh, you know, uh, as it relates specifically to advisors and, and, and navigating the change in their business, and, and you hit on some of these concepts that I, I don't sure everyone's familiar with, but I wonder if you could just kind of hit here a little bit, you know, complexity theory, systems thinking, uh, if you even talk about neuroscience and psychology. So this is all kind of deep stuff for, for most financial advisors. I wonder if you might offer the audience a glimpse into like why these concepts are important and, and how you help advisors navigate and deal with change. Well, let's see if I can sort of tie all of that together. Uh, sure. I started, I started my journey in, in understanding those concepts you just, you just uh, mentioned uh, through a great relationship and, and a friend and a mentor that I, I have, in Dr. Harold Langlois. He's out of, out of Harvard, and uh, um, he was at a conference that I was at, and uh, I just uh, was really intrigued by what he was uh, presenting, and he's, he's in the uh, change management area. And so I got, I got to know him. I tried to hire him to come to work for Canon. That <laughs> didn't work out. But, but, uh, but we just became really great friends. And he challenged me on just about everything that I had held as, as, as a belief. Um, and and that's, that's an underlying uh, theme, I think, for advisors, for myself, for my own experience is the first thing that we have to do is we have to be willing to challenge our own assumptions about how we make mm -hmm. sense of the world so that we can be open to brand new perspectives. So when it comes to change management, one of the challenges that you have with change is you believe the world operates in a certain way. And the physiology of the brain sort of works like this. I like to know. I don't like to think because if I have to think, <laughs> I've got to rewire all my neural pathways. That's a physical activity, which is a lot of work. So you just stick with what you know in terms of the patterns that you already that we already recognize, so that I don't have to operate um, in in a in a way that's that's hard. That's you know it's hard to think. 
when you, when you think about from a neuroscience standpoint, the neurology of the brain, it is physically making connections between different, uh, you know, cells and it's wrapping right. the connections uh, in myelin to make them stronger so that they, they stay, they stay in place and you can, you can recall them. So, so change is really about overcoming your own comfort level. You, you have familiar patterns. You believe the world works in a certain way and you don't want to hear about it. <laughs> I love this. I love this story to, to illustrate this. How many times have you been in a room in a, in a business meeting situation and people are arguing over the definition of a word, <laughs> right? Yeah. And your brain, your brain is sitting there going, this is how I understand the definition to be. Now, if we're going to change that, I've got to go in here and redo all my configurations and, and, and I've got to work to wrap the myelin around these connection points. And that's a lot of hard work. So you get in there and you fight for my definition. So I don't have to do that. <laughs> and that's all happening at the subconscious level. And so that's why change is so difficult for so many people. So, so you've got to, you've got to overcome, uh, yeah the assumptions and be willing to cha challenge those assumptions because once you do, then you open yourself up and your brain sort of opens up to, well, if there are different ways to connect here, maybe there's different ways to connect there. So, so we work a little bit around helping people understand the, uh, that their assumptions about the way the world works are just one perspective of how to, how to see what, what can be. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. Now, and I think now, now once you've got them in a place where there's, they're, they're more open, you can introduce the tools of innovation to them. And the tools of innovation are around value proposition design, you know, what products and services that you want to apply. And, and what those are based on are based on the jobs to be done theories that are coming out of the entrepreneurial schools. Every fintech in, in, uh, that, that started in the last 10 years uses jobs to be done as a, as a, as a platform to figure out what is it that somebody's trying to accomplish that I can build a solution for that will be better than what they have right now. Mm. So the tools around that are, 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 are very specific and there are very uh, structured ways that you go through modeling a business. We call it mo uh, business model design. And then, taking the products and services that you've identified that will work and testing those way before you go out and actually make a big bet to change your whole practice, right? To do something that's completely different. You want to make small little bets, test those, those uh, new assumptions and the new ideas that you have. And if they work, then you make an investment in those. And, and, and I, I created this oxymoron called iterative innovation, right? <laughs> innovation is supposed to be disruptive, sure, but doing sure. small, small iterations and testing new things along the way will give you the confidence and the insight to know whether you need to invest more time, money, and effort into those things. So what we try to do is we try to give them workshops that help them understand the tools and how to use the tools of innovation through examples and, 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 and things like that. So exercises so that when they come out the other end, they're not, they've not just created new things for them to do and new revenue streams and validated the profitability opportunities of those, but they are now prepared for whatever disruption comes, whether it's from technology or society or consumer ch preference changes or whatever, they can use those tools and they can go, here's what we're seeing. Now, how can we take advantage of that using these tool sets that we have to create something that's, that's compelling and that it will be profitable for us as well. Yeah. And, and again, I go back to our original conversation around advisors having built their practice around mimicry, right? Well, mimicry by, by definition, isn't creating something new, right? It's copying yeah. somebody else. And, and because our industry is so embedded with the mimicry, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Show me how you're doing it and I'll go do it. Yeah. See, that doesn't work because you are not them. <laughs> yeah. You're not in their situation. Yeah. So the people that are really are going to be ultra successful are the people that have these skill sets and the capacity to sort of think beyond, you know, mimicry 
and and uh, and and really innovate. So Joe Duran at, at uh, what was his company, Capital uh, Personal Capital, he was a fabulous innovator. Charles Schwab, fabulous innovator, right? What they did was they they looked at they looked at things outside of our industry and brought those things into the industry. Joe Duran brought behavioral economics and he brought uh, emotional intelligence in. He created a platform for advisors to be able to understand people in a different way than just the facts around their financial right. situation. Hugh Massey at Financial DNA has got a fabulous platform for behavioral uh, economics and understanding issues that, uh, and, and the motivational drivers that are influenced by the biases of, of each of us and, and communication preferences and things like that. It's really fascinating, fascinating information. Uh, and, and the platform is really, really great. I want you to interview him. I'm put a yeah. plug in. Oh, awesome. Please send it my way. It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll definitely. But, 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 but the point is that uh, the workshops help people sort of get out of working in the business and thinking about what are the things that, that I can create from a strategic viewpoint that will grow revenues. And we talked about this in our, um, in our pre-call prep work. You know, uh, Michael Porter back in 2010 wrote, wrote the article in HBR called What is Strategy? And in it, he helped define strategy is around thinking about the products and services and the ways to differentiate yourself to generate revenue. Now, contrast that with what the majority of practice management consultants are doing in the industry today, right? And coaches, they're focused on how do you, how do I help an advisor do more, right? Of what they're doing and make more money in that way. It's all about operational efficiency, yeah. which is not bad. Operational efficiency is what drives profitability, but it doesn't drive revenue. So even the business schools, probably for 30 years, taught managers who are focused on wringing out inefficiency and reducing risk by creating a very stable environment. Uh, that's operational efficiency. Yeah. By focusing on that, they were able to create what they thought were lasting companies, right? Yeah. But it, in fact, it was the leaders that were thinking about strategic revenue production, which is a very messy, unstable environment in which you operate. Yeah. So they were the ones that, that actually survived in terms of uh, viability. So yeah. Apple, for example, reinventing itself every once in a while it, it's, it's how do I destroy what I have now using what I have now to bridge to the new what I'm going to be in the future? Yeah. And advisors don't really think about that because they think in terms of their, their work lifetime as opposed to their business's yeah. potential lifetime. This is really fascinating. I, geez, we could go for like another hour. And <laughs> time's coming up here. Uh, you know, this, this is truly, truly, and I, and I think this work is so important for any, uh, individual advisor or RIA firm, uh, that's a multi-advisor shop is that you need to be thinking about the business and, and, and about what's coming next, right? Instead of just dealing with what's in front of you right now, you need to be thinking about how to grow, uh, because I'll tell you what, I recently interviewed uh, a gentleman by the name of Kieran Bowl from uh, McKinsey. And they do an annual uh, report on the state of North American wealth management. And one of the things that they recognized is there's very little growth happening from bringing on new clients and new relationships in this industry. Most advisors are just achieving what my friends and I call free growth because the market has been going up almost sure. every year since 2009, right? It's up, it's up 5X since 2009. So if you were just the worst financial advisor in the world and you just could just hold on to your clients, your business has gone up 5X since 2009. Yeah. Your revenue has just increased. It's like, yeah, why do I have to do any extra work? At some point in time, the market will correct or it'll just go flat for a while. So this era of free growth will at some point in time end. And, and I, I, 
and our industry has gotten a little lazy on, on the growth side. So this, the work that you're doing is so important. And I really appreciate you coming on the show, Bill. Uh, I have a feeling some people are going to want to follow up uh, because of the, of the stuff. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you and follow up to learn a little bit more? Well, they're, they're welcome to contact me at, uh, at Canon Financial Institute. My email address is wtrigleth, T-R-I-G-L-E-T-H, at Canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, financial.com. And they're welcome to give me a call at, to, at, at the office, 706-353-3346. And uh, I'd encourage them to, if they, if they want to really get to a little flavor of what we've talked about uh, in uh, some videos or some white papers, I might uh, check me out on LinkedIn as well. Fantastic. Well, this has been an amazing conversation, Bill. We'll make sure we get all that li- linked up in the show notes. Thank you very much, sir. Pleasure having you on the show. Really enjoyed being with you, Mike, and you're doing great work, and uh, I'm just proud to be a part of it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for listening and or watching this episode of the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's always fantastic to have you with us. Huge props to my man, Bill Trigleth the uh, third. Awesome having him on the show. Had such a great time. This, uh, I, you can just tell, right? You can see it in my face. I was totally geeking out. I just, uh, anytime I get to talk to somebody who's been in the industry longer than I have, who's had that just a depth and breadth, wealth of experience, uh, I just, I eat it up. I'm like, at total little geeky nerd when it comes to this this space. So I hope that came through. Anyways, really appreciate it. As always, uh, please do let us know what you think. Hit us up on the socials. Swing by truelytics.com. Use that contact form. And again, podcast at truelytics. Send those questions and suggestions for guests and topics. Love to hear from you, okay? All right, that's it for today. Please do make sure you are staying safe and healthy. Keep your distance, wear your mask. Get your shot if you haven't done so already. Come on, people. We're going to get back to normal. I want to be recording shows like this in person. All right? Okay, that's it for now. We'll see you next time on the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. See ya. Bye.